Why, hello there! Welcome back. Welcome to part 18 of my build log of the Trumpeter 1 to 200 scale model of the Titanic. Today I'm going to be covering a few different things. Um, the first lot of stuff is quite sort of fine, fiddly model stuff. Uh, so I've been working on quite a lot of the fixtures and fittings for the forecastle deck and the forward well deck. So I'm going to be showing things like some of the, uh, the bollards which are on there. Uh, I've also done most of the winches that come in the kit. I have done the number two and three hatch covers, and I've also finished the first two of the cranes that sit in the Ford Well deck, so I'll be showing all of that. Um, the other thing I'm going to do is I'm going to show you my build process for the new stand that I've built for the boat. I decided ultimately I wasn't very happy with the trumpeter stand. I, I did try to snazz it up a little bit, but still wasn't happy, so I bit the bullet and decided to make a new stand, so I'll show you that as well. So anyway, without any further ado, I will crack on. Just doing some of these winches. Um, right, just before we crack on, I didn't cut myself with this knife. I did that while I was making a salad last night. Um, I just know someone's going to say in the comments, ah, craft knife, cut yourself. Um, but it wasn't, I swear, it was the salad. Um, anyway, so I'm just doing some of these winches. And these are the winches that go on the Foxhall deck next to the mast, the foremast. Um, and I mean, well, my my only my only real thought on these is, crikey, these are good detail. I mean, this is. I could spend a year trying to make one of these by hand, and I would singularly fail. They're just remarkable detail. Um, so all I'm doing is I'm just filing these down, just the stubs where I um, cut them out from the sprue, just filing these down to the microfile. Same on the other side. These have already been washed, by the way. Um, uh, these are resin 3D printed, and occasionally you get sort of non-cured resin on the parts, which, you know, is a bit sticky and a bit horrible, and it doesn't really do your paint job any, any favours. Um, so I've already washed these in some warm water, uh, but it is worth doing that before you crack on with actual building. So you can see, this is the winch I'm making here. I've got the first piece. So I need two off of the big uh, mandrels and two of the small mandrels. Now, the first time I did this, I rather cocked it up and I glued the big mandrels on first, which is a finished winch. As you can see, if you do the big ones first, it makes getting the small ones on really, really tricky. Um, but, you know, we live and learn. I managed it in the end, just added a few moments on to build. So I'm going to start with the small mandrels first this time. You can see there's lots of supports uh, around the uh, 3D print, um, and that's to make sure that the 3D print comes out okay. But you've got to be a wee bit careful, because you need to cut through these supports, but you don't want to cut through the central section, because there's a sort of shaft... Um, in the middle of the mandrel which locates into a hole in the winch and that helps you with gluing um, helps to sort of center things up so as you're cutting out these um, printing struts you don't want to cut through the middle so what I've tended to do um, is I have cut as many of the 3d printing struts as I can reach with my craft knife and then I go in between the two and cut a lot lower down to cut out the central piece. Come on, there we are. Uh, and then I can go around the rest and get it out. Tricky. Oops, did not mean to spray that everywhere. Uh, tricky, but as you can see, once you've done it, if you do it right, you end up with a sort of little so little ends to the shaft, and that helps you with your gluing massively. Uh, now I'm using CA for this, the Flex CA, and if I'm honest, I'm being reasonably liberal with it. Um, I sort of feel like once we're at this level of detail, a little splodge of glue doesn't matter that much. And I just sort of think that, you know, thinking about where my model needs to be, uh, I do want to make sure these parts are solid, you know. And because of that shaft, it's actually relatively easy to get these on straight. Um, this glue takes a couple of seconds to cure, so I, t I tend to get the thing in position and then just make sure it's all lined up properly. 
And there we are, it's not quite done yet. Sorry if you can't see this on the camera. I know it's it's just not the easiest thing in the world to film while you're doing it. Anyway, so there's one and we'll move on to the next one. This is one of those things that it does become a bit easier the more you do, you know. The first couple of winches I did took absolutely ages. These ones are taking a lot less time, to be fair. Uh, so, you know, just as with everything modelling, slow and or steady wins the race, I think. Although in this case, it's not really a race, is it? It's just building a model. That one went on really easily. Okay, happy days, there we are. That's another winch done. Right, here's the first lot of winches done. Uh, these two for the Ford Well deck, and then these three for the Vauxhall deck. So, are they perfect? No, they're not. But are they good? Yes, I'm pretty happy with them. Um, desperately fiddly, but worth the effort. And I mean, the level of detail on these is such that I really don't think, um, now that I've got these, I'm like, I don't know if I could really go back to what was in the original set because the, they're just so well detailed. Like, you know, even the, um, they've even got things like the uh, spines in the uh, mandrels and stuff. It's just brilliant, it really is good. So anyway, I'm gonna leave these to cure. So I'm gonna lock the door of the shed so I don't have any temptation to come back, let them cure, and then I can paint them. So to paint these winches, I'm using my airbrush with a color called NATO Green. Um, so this is a Tamiya colour, uh, and the product number is XF67, so X-Ray Foxtrot 67. Um, and what I'm trying to get here is a colour called Machinery Green. Um, and I don't know if, 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 if any of you have ever ha be, like, been in a workshop, maybe at school or at college or uni or in, in work or wh wherever, you'll often see machines like drills or lathes or things painted a sort of quite rich dark green uh, not dissimilar to like a British racing green um, and this is supposedly the colour that Titanic's winches were painted as well 
so that's what I'm trying to recreate, and it's I've sort of I've, I've been struggling to um, to find the right kind of colour, and this is the one I've finally come up with. I think it's quite a close match, and certainly in scale terms, I think it looks quite good. To simplify the painting as much as possible, I um, stuck the bases of these winches onto a sheet of standard sellotape, uh, which on the whole seemed to work quite well, although as you saw a couple of seconds ago, didn't work so well when the sellotape sort of rucks up. Um, but it did allow me to move all the winches round uh, to get sort of better angles to spray into the sort of nooks and crannies in the 3D printed parts. The next thing to paint is the dark mast colour on the bottom of the crane uh, machinery housings. Um, thank you to the viewer who commented telling me the colour of the dark mast. Uh, in the last video I was making a bit of a fool of myself calling it sort of orangey browny kind of colour. Um, so thank you for that, that's very helpful. That saves me some dignity for this episode. Um, to start with, I am using some tips from other viewers. So to start with, I'm actually spraying a layer of white on top of the masking that I've done. Uh, and the reason for this is to stop the dark mast colour dribbling under the masking tape and sort of ruining the effect. So by spraying a coat of white on first, you're sort of sealing the masking tape up, and then you can paint on your dark mast colour um, without sort of having to worry about, about the paint leaking through. And so now the masking tape is all sealed up, here we go with the dark mast colour. Uh, the dark mask colour I'm using, again, is Humbrol Matte 61. Just as a point, by the way, uh, make sure you leave time between your different coats. So I'm cutting the video here, I basically just turned the camera on and left it running for about, I don't know, 15, 20 minutes or so. So I've just sort of spliced my actual spraying of the airbrush into a fairly short clip. Um, but in reality I sort of, I did a coat, went away, made a cup of tea, came back five minutes later, did another coat, went away, you know, and sort of built it up slowly. So it's quite important you do that, otherwise you're going to end up with, potentially the paint won't dry properly. Um, and you'll also, you, you increase the risk of paint running and that sort of stuff, so it is worth leaving some time between coats. So, here's one crane done. I haven't shown all of the work because I just think it, it, this has been about six hours work and I just don't think anyone has enough time in their lives to watch someone make eight cranes at six hours each. Um, but there's a few things I want to draw the attention to. So, there's a little hook. I don't know if you can quite see it in focus. There's a hook there connecting the crane onto the jib. What I really like about this set as well is that the um, the PE is sort of showing relaxed cables as if um, the cables aren't supporting the weight of the jib, which makes sense because the jib's meant to be resting on a sort of resty, craney thing. Um, I painted the cables a sort of steel colour because I believe that these were steel cables. Uh, and the rest of the crane is in white, the floor is in grey and I've left a couple of little pieces. I've left the uh, I've left the tip of the hook there in brass, and I have also left um, the inside of the the jib's wheel 
and brass as well, just to sort of add a bit more sort of scenic detail, I guess. Um, but that's one, uh, all finished now, just need to do the actual base for it, and I'm happy with that. Um, believe it or not, once it's glued up, it's actually quite solid. So um, I'm fairly confident about being able to put this on the deck and it not sort of being that susceptible to damage, because it is actually, once you've glued all these things together, and turned and bent the um, photo etch into a box, it does actually become reasonably solid. So um, that should be okay. So in this clip, I am adding some of the brass parts onto some of the uh, forecastle and poop deck fixings. Um, what I tend to do is I tend to put the brass parts onto a stick of blue tack just to make sure they don't like you know get knocked and fall onto the carpet where they'll never be found again. Um, that's just an idea that works for me. To get the glue as accurate as possible, what I tend to do is I, uh, I tend to dip a very thin brass rod into the glue bottle um, and then just touch that rod against the area where I want the, the glue to go and sort of capillary action just sort of pulls it onto the part and I find that gives you a lot more control over how much glue you get and the sort of way you manage to place the glue than you would get by just using the bottle's nozzle. So, here are the first lot of deck fixings down, and I'm very happy with them. Let's bring them over to the light so you can see a bit better. But you can see they are very, very nice, and it's really pleasant the way that the scale decks just has the different type of planking near where the fixings should be which is the mahogany planks rather than the pine. And it's just so good. I mean, this looks already, this looks about 50,000 million times better than any other model I've ever made. Um, and of course, none of it's down to the skill of the modeler. It's all just down to the quality of the components. But yeah, I'm really happy with this. So I shall carry on. So I'm now looking at the cargo hatch covers and these come in the KA set. And I think they are cast resin parts. Um, and when I got mine, Parts of the, uh, the the very bottom sections of them uh, were, s were not quite right. There was a little casting defect. So what I did was I um, I filled those cracks with, uh, with modelling putty, and I'm just in this clip sanding it down prior to painting.
As you can see, I have now painted my hatch covers. This is number one hatch cover, uh, and somewhere over there is number two hatch cover. Um, as you might have noticed in previous videos, I'm quite a stickler for trying to get things correct. Um, and I, you know, I'd spent a long time trying to work out whether the, the sides of these hatches were in dark mast or whether they should be in black. And I've eventually gone for black, and if I'm honest, I've taken a lot of the inspiration for that off things like the Facebook groups uh, devoted to this model and Titanic models generally. Um, but one thing I'm wanting to do is I want to pick out a little bit more of the detail on this because there's some really nice detailing, um, which I think you won't be able to see. You know, if you look really close up, you can see, you know, the little ropes and stuff securing the hatch and so on. But bear in mind, this model is either going to be on a lake many, many metres away from you, or, very best case scenario, it's going to be in a display case where, you know, the best will in the world, you're going to be at least a foot away from it. And if you're a foot away from this, all you can really see is a black and white hatch cover. So one of the things I'm wanting to do is just to pick out some of the little bits of detail. So to do that, I'm just going to paint the strings on this hatch cover uh, in a sort of tan kind of, um, <clears throat> a sort of almost like a hemp kind of colour string. Um, whether that's accurate or not, I don't know. Um, but I do feel that it'll sort of just serve to promote the detail a bit better on the model, which I think is useful. Um, you know, having spent a reasonable amount of money on the KA kit, I do want to make sure the details are clear and obvious for people to see. we have a problem or actually we don't really but as you can see 
these don't quite block out the light from the portholes underneath, which is a little bit of an issue because um, it kind of ruins the effect. So this is something I was kind of expecting, and you, know, you can see it in a few other places down here, you know, there, 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 there. Uh, some of these holes are going to get cut out and covered. You know, these ones are for anchor chains, so those will probably resolve themselves. These are for capstans, so again, they'll probably resolve themselves. Other ones, like that for example, may continue to be an issue. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use some modelling filler, possibly JB Weld, not sure which, uh, but I'm going to use some modelling filler on the underside. wouldn't dare do it on the overside because of the, uh, the scale decks, but I'll just, you know, take the deck off flip it over, whack a reasonably liberal amount of seal on there, and that should stop any light penetrating through. Easy. In this clip I am attaching the deck fixings into the Fordwell deck. Uh, I've just put the um, bases for the cranes in um, and I'm now going to fit the uh, winches in place. Uh, you'll notice that I've, um, I've actually painted the very base of the winches in black uh, and that's because the sources I've looked at suggests that the very very bases of them were in black uh, and the rest of the body was in um, machinery green.
as you can see, the first time I did this, uh, the, the jib of the left-hand crane didn't quite interlock as I wanted it with the right-hand crane. So I had to use some CA debonder um, to remove the left-hand crane and give it another whack. And the second time, I managed to get the two jibs to interlock correctly. And now, I have a case for the boat. Um, I'll put some details uh, in the description about who made the thing. Um, really nice company based in the UK um, and remarkably cheap. I looked all over the internet and I couldn't find anything that I would sort of define as being affordable. Uh, and then I found this company, which were they're just remarkably cheap um, and a really, really nice, really nice, simple case. Um, Really nice guy came around to deliver it. It was just, I was just really happy with the entire service, to be honest. Um, and I'm sort of at the point now where I feel that because I'm getting into the proper modelly nitty gritty detail, I think it's star it's it's worth now um, starting to try to protect the model from dust and stuff. Um, because otherwise, uh, you know, there's no point finishing the model and then protecting it from the dust because dust is going to accumulate as you go. And if I'm working on this for another six months, it's worth thinking about this sort of thing now. So yeah, I'm really happy with that. Obviously it's a big model, so it's a big case, which equates to a heavy case. So I've had to get these suction pads to lift it. Um, but with them, it actually becomes remarkably easy to move around and stuff. So I've decided that I don't like the trumpeter stand. I've sort of tried to snazz it up as much as I can, but if I'm honest, I still don't particularly like it. So what I've decided to do instead is try to build a sort of, um, dry dock style um, uh, support for the boat underneath. So to get some ideas for this, uh, I look back through some of my holiday photos. Um, and back in 2013, I went on a sort of weekend break to Belfast. And obviously, one of the things I did when I was there was have a look around the, uh, the Titanic side of the city. Um, and what I'm wanting to try to recreate is these sort of stocks you have in the middle of the dry dock. Um, so these are photos that I actually took at the time, and you can see that they're sort of made out of interlocking cast iron wedges with um, chocks of wood on top. And this is the sort of thing I want to try to recreate as much as possible. Um, I'm fairly confident the ones that are in the Thompson Dry Dock now are not the same ones that were there when Titanic was completed. Um, in fact, I'd be astounded if they were, but this is the sort of idea I want to try to replicate. So to do that, I have bought myself some planks of wood. So what I've got is this stuff. Um, so these are mahogany planks and they are, they're the kind of things you would use if you were building a wooden model boat, which was actually planked, you know. Uh, got them off a model company online and I'll put a link in the description. Um, but they were only about, I think I paid about nine pounds for however many of these there are. And what I'm gonna do is I'm going to stack them up. So I'm going to cut them up into smaller pieces, much smaller pieces, uh, and then I'll stack them up like this uh, and make sort of chocks underneath the boat, um, which should look quite nice, should look like a bit of a dry dock. And so what I'll do is I'll do a row all the way down the keel of the boat and then I've got some of this. This is oak dowel. And what I thought I would do is I'd then add some of some cuts of this to the sides of the boat, more where the um, bilge keel is, uh, to act like sort of almost like acro props. Um, and certainly from a lot of the photos I've seen of Titanic and Olympic and other ships in dry dock, that's what tended to happen. They would have a sort of a row of planks of wood under the keel and then sort of almost like trunks of trees propping up the ship uh, from, from further away from the keel. So you join me in a pretty chilly shed. Um, what I've done is I've made myself a little jig, and I mean, we're not talking fancy woodwork here, we're talking three pieces of wood from the uh, off-cut box, uh, just bits of wood that I've had lying around from other things. Um, and the idea is quite simple, really. Just pop that pop my planks in there, saw onto this edge, all the way down, and then repeat, 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 until I'm out of planks. Easy. 
as you can see, the bucket is filling up. Uh, not entirely sure how many I'm going to need. The are, they aren't entirely accurate, but believe it or not, I'm, I'm sure you probably won't believe this, but I am deliberately trying to make them slightly different lengths uh, because I want to give the impression that, you know, this is stock wood that's held outside the dry dock and then just piled up in advance of a ship coming in. So I don't want it to be super, super accurate. Uh, I just want it to sort of have that impression of a sort of customised uh, finish to it. So you're joining me in the middle of quite a repetitive task. Well, I say quite, there's nothing quite about it. It's unbelievably repetitive. Here is some of the glued chocks that I've already done. You can see that I've tried to get them so, you know, the things don't quite line up. There's a bit of sort of, you know, there's a bit of variation in them. Uh, and I've got some with sort of long bases where they had enough wood to make a, a full size chalk. And then I've got a few where the bases are pretty much the same width as the top. Just going for a bit of selection and a bit of variety there. Now, how I'm doing it, it's really simple actually. Uh, let the camera over. Here we go. So here's one. Here's six pieces that I've already cut out and just selected to put together. I'm using the Gorilla Glue, same stuff I'm using for the scale decks. Uh, this ain't ever going to get wet because this is going to be, this is just on the stand sitting at home. Uh, and then just a reasonable amount of glue on top of each. Build up the stack. Don't need masses of glue. Uh, this is decent, strong glue, to be honest. And I mean... At the best of times, this glue is strong and the wood is relatively absorbent as well. And last one. There we are. And then to sort of align them as I want them, I'll do that. Make sure that they're all flat with each other. Wipe off any excess, same on the other side. And then to provide enough clamping force to keep them together as they dry, I'm just using cheapy sellotape. Um, this is good because it adheres very well to itself, but it hardly adheres at all to the wood. So as long as you wrap the tape around the wood tightly enough, you get a good clamping force but you'll still be able to remove that really quickly. Easy. So once I'd built up all my wooden blocks, um, I then decided to lay some sort of rails down in the middle of the stand. So what I did was I worked out how wide the blocks were apart. Um, and there's variation across all these blocks, but I tried to make a sort of average um, of how wide they all were. And then I glued two full length planks down in parallel. And this, this sort of, these two rails almost run the entire length of the stand. And this was one of the few places in this little sort of semi-project where I really did have to be accurate. Um, because where these blocks sit defines where the keel will sit in the stand, in the case. Um, so these have, these have to be right in the middle, otherwise the boat may not actually fit in the case properly. So I've done the tricky bit now, and I've got my... Uh sort of mahogany track all the way down. So the next bit is to glue the individual stocks down like that. Obviously doing a better job than I'm doing whilst holding the camera, but you know, one and the next and the next and the next with a decent amount of spacing between each one. Simple. So I started gluing. Uh, I, I'm using CA glue for this because I wanted a pretty strong bond. Um, and I'm using a another plank of the same type of mahogany to space these out. So each of the wooden blocks is spaced exactly the same width as itself away from the next and so on and so on. So 
So here we are. Here is the finished stand. And overall, I'm really happy with it. I think it's come out really well. Um, you know, when you contrast it to those pictures from the Thompson Graving Dock in Belfast, it's not identical, but I think you sort of, you do capture the kind of idea that I'm going for, you know, these sort of like planks which are slightly out of line with each other, stretching all the way out into the distance, you know? It gives you a sort of sense of scale of the, of the, of the ship itself, you know? Um, so quite a time consuming piece of work, not particularly challenging, you know, I think, you know, cutting the planks out took a lot of time and gluing them together took a lot of time, but it, it not, you know, it's not particularly tricky. It's not sort of fine modeling, uh, just time consuming, you know? Um, and you think, you know, there's, there's a lot of these chocks and each of them are made up of six individual planks and some at the end are slightly raised to accommodate for the uh, the bow sort of you know curving up at the top and similarly at the stern there are some raised ones as well uh, the other thing that i've done is i've added these sort of um i think i've been calling them sort of acro props um and mostly they are just for sort of visual effect you know they're designed to look like they're propping the ship up and keeping her on an even keel. The reality is they're not really needed to keep the ship stable. Uh, the ship will actually sit perfectly happily on these blocks. These are actually more than wide enough for the ship to rest on. Uh, so the ship would sit perfectly happily on these without a care in the world. Um, so these are mostly there for decoration. One of the things they do do though, which is quite useful, is that they help you to sort of locate the ship on the stand. So, you know, when you put the ship down, when you plonk it down, you know that when the bow is touching these two and sort of mating up against them, you know that the bow is in the correct position and it's, you know, close enough to the edge that the boat will fit into the case, but not so close that it's going to hit the glass and same on the other side. So they do serve quite a useful purpose as well. So um, overall, I'm really happy with this. Uh, so what I'm going to do now is I'll pop the boat on the stand uh, and then I will show you the final effect. So here we are, and I've got to say I am really happy with how this has turned out. Uh, it does give you that sort of industrial kind of feeling, you know, of a ship in construction. You can almost sort of, I can almost imagine JP Morgan and Bruce Ismay walking alongside the, the ship during construction and if you zoom out, you get that idea of one of the famous photos of Titanic in the stocks at Harland and Wolf. So this is exactly what I'm going for. You know, it's something else that it just stops the stand being something to plonk the boat on. And it actually makes it something of interest in its own right, you know. Uh, and that is exactly what I'm after, really. So um, I'm really happy with how this has turned out. Tricky and time consuming, but ultimately, I think, quite worthwhile. So that's it for this episode. I'll leave you with some pictures of the boat in dry dock and of some of the bits and bobs I have modelled over the last couple of weeks. Uh, I feel like I've made some pretty good progress in the last few weeks, but I have obviously been off, off work with, um, with Christmas and such. Um, and I wasn't actually, I was planning on going back home to, uh, for Christmas, but the, uh, the lockdown we've had in the UK stopped me doing that. So I had quite a lot of time to invest in the model. Um, so I feel like, I, you know, I really have made quite a few strides forward, you know, I've got the case up and I've done a lot of the work on the forecastle deck and the um, the forward well deck as well. So good progress, probably likely to slow down a wee bit now that I'm back at work and such. But but anyway, um, so thank you very much for watching this. I do hope you've enjoyed it and you've got some ideas and things. Uh, if you have got any questions, comments, uh, whatever, leave them down below and I will do my absolute best to get back to you. Um, if you've enjoyed it, please do like and subscribe, and I will see you in the next one. Bye for now.